Hi everyone. I hope you all are doing well. My name is Evan Fanis and I am the host. I am the lead for Jury the Asia Group uh, at Today for AI. Uh, today is our first uh, guest session by a very special guest. Uh, Zubair is a final year PhD candidate at Georgia Institute of Technology. Uh, he's working with Dr. George Kira, and his research focus includes 3D perception, scene understanding, and evolving AI. Uh, he has a great expertise in nurse efficient 3D object detection, 60 pose estimation, semantic and spatial reasoning. He has worked with the uh, Toyota Research Institute in machine learning and robotics department, as well as Stanford Research Institute. He has a great background in robotics, deep learning, and AI. Uh, today's session will be on learning 3D in the presentations. Uh, so without wasting any time, I'll invite Zubair to start the session. Thank you for- yeah, Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Ahmed. Um, let me quickly share my screen. And let's see if it's all working. Yeah, we can see your screen. Can you all see my screen and hear me fine? And not see the screen notes, I guess? Yes, we can. Uh, I notes, notes are not visible. Okay, notes are not visible. <laughs> okay, awesome. Um, I can get started. And um, yeah, so um, hi everyone. So I um, thanks a lot for the kind introduction. Um, I'm Zubair Shad, and the title of my talk today would be learning object and agent centric neural 3D scene representations. Um, and this is a joint work with Toyota Research Institute as well as Georgia Tech. Um, so recent advances in deep learning have led to a data-centric intelligence in the last decade. Um, that is artificially intelligent model, unlocking the potential to ingest a large amount of data and be really good at performing tasks such as uh, text to image generation, um, generating elaborate pieces of text for machine human conversation, as well as detailed um, 3D understanding from just multi-view images. So our goal today would be to study approaches that unlock the potential of uh, principle-centric intelligence so essentially utilizing uh, pre-training on large synthetic data to generalize to real world settings without using a large amount of real world labels. Um, and again, the approach that we'll be taking today to get there is to use um, inductive bias and priors um, in some form. Um, and so we would study fundamentals method um, that would really enable long-term applications like these. So we wanna put um, robots in the hand of real world people, uh, have some sort of generalizable autonomy, so let's say a model uh, A can do tasks B and C at the same time, and some sort of fleet learning where um, the goal is really um, learning from like a lot of different unstructured uh, environments as well. So let's quickly recap uh, some of the shape representations actually that we'll be talking in our talk today. So these are really divided to discrete versus uh, continuous representations. Um, the first one we, that we have here is fully discrete representation, which is comprising of voxel grids, where um, the shape is really, uh, let's say in this case, uh, a chair of some kind is divided into discrete set of cubes where the resolution of these like voxels det determines uh, the granularity or coarseness of the shape. Um, the second representation that we have here is point clouds, where which is um, also called an explicit representation where the shape here is represented by um, three values, which is um, X, Y, and Z coordinates. Um, and third, we have meshes, uh, where um, basically the shape that we have here is determined by the vertices and fa faces, where we can easily sort of store these in some, some sort of form, like uh, tensors or, or maybe even num numpy arrays. And lastly, um, the shape that we have here um, is like different from the others that we looked so far, is implicit representations. Um, and the output here is basically um, a scalar field. So outputting a zero or one, which determines whether the point really lies inside um, the surface or outside the surface. So that's why it's called an energy-based sort of formulation um, to optimize this. And today we'll be looking at um, these two sort of shape um, representations in our talk today. So in the case of deep neural networks, uh, we usually represent this function um, as F theta, where uh, for each uh, 3D point X, Y, Z in the world coordinate frame, the function really outputs a single value, which is either an occupancy like a zero or one, um, or it outputs a continuous value, which is um, uh, in case like from an X, Y, Z coordinates, it's a sign distance value to the surface uh, with the positive or negative sign. 
Now we can either learn a single network per category, um, or uh, which basically means that you are uh, overfit to a certain category given X, um, Y uh, image uh, or label pairs, um, or just coordinates in label pairs, or we could maybe do a more sophisticated way to learn um, these uh, basically functions where we could basically learn a latent vector Z per instance by using a single MLP for all instances within a category. Um, and this is possible since all shapes share the same semantic structure. Um, and another way to learn this would be to use an encoder at the input. So for, let's say for a given modality, let's say partial point clouds, um, or even an image, you output a latent vector Z, which is then passed to um, a network F theta, uh, which again outputs like either a zero or one or a sign distance function. Let's also quickly recap another important concept here, which is 60 pose estimation of an object, um, and which is really defined as uh, a rotation matrix in a translation vector from a, which takes you from a canonical coordinate frame of reference to a target orientation and location. And the rotation matrix here is usually determined by a nine dimensional uh, matrix. The translation vector is a three dimensional vector. Um, and the size information uh, is usually, it may be available beforehand or it might not be available. Uh, and that adds another sort of three degrees of uh, unknown into our model. Um, so if you have CAD models available for um, an unknown instances, you, you have the size information available. And in that case, we don't need to regress it using another uh, network. So again, uh, to learn this using deep learning, um, here we, we use a neural network, again, parameterized by some um, weights F theta. Uh, and we have um, some input modalities, let's say image or depth maps or point clouds, and we output rotation, translation, and um, scale for the object of interest. Now here's our, here are some of the applications of these sort of mid-level outputs, as we call it. So we don't directly sort of predict these control outputs um, as our neural network parameterization. We output these like 3D bounding boxes or poses or even shapes. So um, at the first one, we this really enables, as you can see, a robot is grasping these um, boxes. So you can uh, sort of fit a very tighter bounding box. And you can see like if you have our rotation and translation defined in the robot's camera coordinate frame, you can literally just go to that location and have like some sort of a grasping policy to pick up that object of interest. On the second part, we have AR, VR augmentations. You might have seen some of these like um, filters going on. So they, they track these like head pose of this line and, and do all of these like cool uh, uh, visualizations. And um, again, with recent successes of like um, these like text to 3D, um, uh, diffusion models, you can use these object-centric representations to create like um, really more uh, creative content um, online, or just like it, it's kind of also extending to like creating like whole scenes of the world, which is like an active area of research these days. Let's also quickly uh, review and take a step back and review this embodied AI paradigm. So we, we discussed like how we can given an observation here in the form of maybe just RGB depth or maybe some instructions. Um, you can use a neural network to um, solve this problem and the neural network outputs actions which can be either solved using supervised learning or a reward paradigm. Um, but the task that we uh, study today is basically again uh, deviate from the usual end-to-end -end learning paradigm which learns an out intermediate output. And then you can again use like a classical pipeline such as a robot controller to like go to that location, grasp that object um, and, 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 and use like a classical rule-based policy. And this intermediate output could be of the form of six top grass poses, uh, 3D bounding boxes, 3D object shapes, as well as 3D object appearances. And in the first work, we'll see how we can really predict uh, in a very, very efficient way these two quantities. Um, so again, uh, for autonomous systems, the first step is understanding the 3D world around us. And so the actual task that we'll be seeing in the first work today is basically given a single input RGBD observation, our, our, our goal is really to reconstruct the 3D shapes of all objects in the image. Um, have predict all of the 60 poses and sizes as well as the appearances of all of these objects. And we call this category level holistic um, sort of 3D object understanding task since we don't have access to prior CAD models of instances in inference time to solve this task. 
Um, and here again, we review some of these like uh, applications, which is robotics grasping, category level manipulation, as well as asset creation and the like. So Priorworks uh, really uh, basically use multi-stage complex pipelines for these tasks, um, as shown here. Uh, first, they independently apply like two stages, one for performing 2D detections and another for performing, let's say, shape reconstruction as well as both estimation. And these are again, um, the neural networks, like a very uh, basic MLP that we just saw in the, in, in the first few slides. Um, this pipeline is really not computationally expensive. Um, it's not um, scalable and it's low performance on real world normal object instances due to their inability to express explicit representations of shape variations within a category. So in contrast, we propose to reconstruct, um, basically solve this like a uh, very challenging task, which is reconstructing 3D shapes, six decomposed and sizes um, of novel objects from just a single view, basically in a single forward pass. So we'll see some of the key highlights of the prior methods where you can see these prior methods really use anchor based approaches. So they need these 2D detectors and then they feed these 2D detectors to the backbone, which then reconstructs shapes or poses and sizes. Um, they're usually disjoint re representation. As you can see, they have two different multi-layer perceptrons or MLPs for this task. Um, they're very slow to reconstruct, as we'll see later. So, uh, and primarily they're bottlenecked by these two-state approaches. Um, again, um, if you use mask RCNN, some of you have um, used it, it's like really, really slow to infer and even um, some of train these models. They're category specific, which means that they really need um, labels or instance mask of a certain category to perform prediction. So let's say they, they train the shape neural network, one shape neural network for all instances within a category. Um, and during inference, you have to pick and choose uh, which category you are playing around with. So um, you need the labels and instance mask of uh, these instances. And they have multiple forward passes for each task, which means the heads can be at different level of expertise. Uh, which really means that they don't have a sort of parameter sharing between these two neural networks. Um, and since we know that these tasks are really tightly coupled, um, they can make sort of different mistakes um, at different um, sort of outputs in, in, in the neural network. As opposed to this, our approach is really um, anchor free, uh, which means that we do a single shot reconstruction. It, uh, it allows for joint shape reconstruction in object centric scene context. Um, it's really, really fast uh, in the sense that we use uh, a single shot approach. We don't have these two stage multi complex pipelines, and we have shown it to be basically 10x faster than some of these state of the art approaches, uh, which is almost real time. Uh, our method is also category agnostic, which means that we train a single decoder network for all sort of categories uh, or instances uh, in, in those categories. So we don't have to pick and choose in inference time which um, shape neural network to get. Um, for inference. And lastly, uh, we have parameter sharing uh, for, for, for our backbone as well as some of the heads. So if one head makes some mistake, then the other head would sort of agree with it. So I think that is really sort of interpretable and is really useful in some of these applications. So the recap of our main theme here is utilizing um, geometry priors uh, for efficient and real-time shape reconstruction um, as well as 60 pose inside estimation. So the proposed method is really divided into four major blocks here. Um, and so first we learn a spatial per pixel representation of multiple objects at their central locations using these feature, feature pyramid backbone, um, and which really allows us to learn these multi-scale uh, resolution features from our both RGB and depth modality. We then have uh, basically our technique directly regresses multiple shape, pose, and size codes, uh, which we basically denote as object-centric 3D parameter maps. And essentially every pixel in these 3D parameter map kind of denotes votes for the most probable um, shape, pose, and instance code during inference time. Uh, we do, do this joint uh, sort of uh, 3D pre-training uh, for these auto encoders to learn canonical shape codes from a large database of shapes. And here is basically where we inject priors into the network. So uh, we talked about synthetic data priors and uh, we'll see how we can sort of inject some of these priors into the network where uh, it will really help us regress uh, for the 2D uh, regression tasks in the downstream application. 
And lastly, we basically using task specific heads uh, and this point decoder, uh, we directly optimize for detection, reconstruction, and 6D pose estimation simultaneously using supervised losses. So here we review the specifics of each of the blocks. So first we use our ResNet FPN backbone to get um, low resolution features, um, again, from uh, to get to learn these like multi-scale features from all RGB and depth fidelity. We use task specific heads, uh, one for each instance map um, prediction, as well as object centric 3D map prediction. Um, and finally, a single 3D decoder really allows us to perform um, category agnostic reconstruction, where we again learn a, a single neural network for all instances in our database. So to pre-train these 3D shape representation, we choose a point cloud as a representation of choice. Um, and the model is really comprised of an auto decoder architecture. So going back to um, one of the earlier slides with one latent code Z, which really determines um, the semantic sort of structure for um, the instance in the category. Uh, and the decoder is basically same uh, MLP for all instances in the category. And this really allows us to sort of inject these geometry priors as well as learn um, a single model for all uh, instances in a network. And these geometry priors really come from um, sort of shape net um, models where these are readily available um, online. Uh, and these are uh, basically artists created like uh, CAD models. So we use uh, 50 shape net categories and around 50 CAD models to learn this sort of uh, a very um, less parameterized neural network. Uh, and the architecture here is basically a con decon neural network architecture, which is also what we call an auto encoder architecture. And the, uh, the goal really here is to reconstruct uh, shapes. And in doing so, we can learn basically this compactified um, Z representation that we uh, basically care about. Um, so the, we, we want to reconstruct the input point clouds uh, as the output point cloud using this shame for distance loss. Um, and we want to use this like complexified shape representation um, later uh, in our downstream sort of 2D regression task. So here we show per instance reconstruction of sort of uh, multiple instances and even across categories in our data set. And here 15 um, categories are shown um, as like TSNE embeddings where we basically show that um, they can really reconstruct a, a disentangled 3D representation, which is really helpful in our 2D downstream regression task. So the benefit of 3D learning prior in this, this case is that we can basically use a strong uh, prior for 2D regression task. And in this case, we regress these shape codes from a single view RGBD in a very, very fast manner. Um, and then we can optimize them jointly. So here we really optimize three different loss functions, and um, primarily, oops, uh, so primarily, uh, basically we we primarily train it on synthetic um, data with very minimal real world fine tuning. And one of the things that we are actually looking at is like just to uh, remove that real world fine tuning altogether and just learn from synthetic data, which is uh, one of the follow up works that we are actually working uh, on. So we really optimize for three different supervised losses where the instance loss here is again, the mean squared error loss between uh, predicted and ground truth um, heat maps. Uh, the object centric 3D parameter map is a Huber loss between supervised using ground truth um, parameter maps where the latent vectors really come from the 3D pre-training stage. And lastly, uh, we have this artificial free depth prediction loss, which really improves a uh, sim to real transfer uh, where we have shown where we inject noise uh, into our perfect sort of sensors in the simulation to make it closer to the real world. And we have shown it to be like three to 4%. Uh, um, it has uh, shown three to 4% improvement in the same career transfer case. So here we show the task and the data set where we use uh, NOx synthetic and real uh, 275 data set where NOx synthetic is uh, much, much larger around like 100 times larger. Like, we use 275,000 examples, uh, where for the real uh, world case, we only use uh, a couple of thousand examples for fine tuning our network. And the goal for this representation is really for to reconstruct um, 3D shapes, perform uh, 3D detection, as well as um, do 60 pose and size estimation, where uh, we measure these uh, 3D detection performance using IOU metrics, which is really the percentage of bounding box overlap 
we measure six D both in size accuracy using these um, accuracy using X degree twice per centimeter overlap. Um, so let's say it's a threshold where um, if 25% uh, of your uh, instances lie within that threshold, then your accuracy would be uh, that 25 number. Uh, and then finally, we use a shame for distance loss for shape reconstruction. So here uh, you can see some of the pose estimation performance in comparison to the strong baselines. As you can see, we can fit like a really tight bounding box across these objects of interest. And um, these are per frame prediction. That's why you see these like jitter in these observations. So we, our task is just a single view, uh, 6D pose and size estimation. So here we, we, we do this uh, for all the frames in our um, sort of, let's say, video. Here you can see some of the qualitative shape reconstruction results where you can really see some of the fine grained geometric details. Um, let's say the mug handle, which is really, really helpful for let's um, grasping uh, scenarios. And finally, you can see some of the depth map reconstruction uh, comparison to the depth map reconstruction. Uh, so if we just like lift the depth point cloud um, to 3D, depth map to 3D point cloud, you see some of these really like a partial shapes where R can, ours can really complete these shapes and also to, to certain degree get their textures, uh, which uh, as you'll see is not perfect um, here. So we benchmarked this method on basically both detection and 6D pose estimation metrics and compared with strong baselines. And we really show that our method uh, improves 60 pose and size estimation on real world NOx by 12.5% uh, when evaluated on this like 10 degree centimeter metric and really shows 2.7% improvement on 3D object detection metric. Uh, and you can see we uh, it, it performed reasonably well on real world instances by uh, achieving like an 83% uh, IOU, as well as uh, some 93% IOU on this camera 25, uh, which is purely synthetic um, domain. And one interesting observation here is that um, all of these uh, sort of baselines are category specific representation. To, so they really need instance mass and labels during inference to predict these uh, shape and pose where ours is category agnostic. So you can, um, you don't need instance mass or labels uh, for all of these and, and still uh, beat all of these baselines by uh, uh, some reasonable margin. And lastly, this is again shape reconstruction metric, which is again a chamfer between ground truth and predicted point clouds. And you can see some of the uh, improved performance between uh, our, our method and, and the baseline methods. So finally, we also ablate our network for, uh, to show the effect of different, uh, changing the different uh, uh, input modalities as well as shape uh, head, uh, training regime and depth, depth auxiliary losses on um, the final network performance. Uh, and so we do this like a lot of uh, analysis here. So first analysis here uh, that we did is that this mono RGB sensor um, sort of gives the lowest performance where um, it, it, it kind of makes sense since 2D to 3D is an ill post problem and the task is really 3D in nature. Um, and so uh, it, it's also a no brainer that the RGBD would perform well. So it's nice to ablate this always. Um, and then finally, a very interesting observation is that the shape prediction network also helps boost the network's performance for the pose and size estimation. And we really talked earlier about some of the tight coupling between these two input modalities. Um, and, 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 and we have also seen that they kind of make the same mistake if uh, one had sort of uh, predicts the wrong shape or, or the wrong instances or doesn't get the, 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 the actual labels the other head kind of agrees with it and, and do, does the same mistake. So, um, and adding this, this shape head actually improves the performance of the other heads as well, since the losses are really back propagated to, to the other losses at the backbone level as well. And finally, uh, we really show that uh, there's depth auxiliary losses where we inject noise uh, to make our real uh, synthetic um, sort of depth sensors um, match the real world depth sensors really also improve performance by like two to three percent on real world um, novel object instances. And here we show our timing comparison where we really uh, achieve a, a 25 to 40 FPS frame rate, which is really fast enough for real time applications. And it's really um, uh, faster than a lot of these uh, prior state approaches like 4x faster than mesh RCNN and around 10x faster than some of the other pose estimation uh, approaches that we saw earlier. 
Um, so again, uh, this is uh, a follow-up work and uh, basically this is not part of the talk today, but I'm just quickly gonna highlight uh, how we extended center snap to this uh, uh, articulated object reconstruction as well, where we basically extend, uh, not have this rigid body assumption in the center snap model, uh, but we kind of introduced this like very strong uh, joint agnostic reconstruction method uh, where this method was trained fully in simulation. And we um, kind of use these like stereo pairs for, for, for reconstruction of these um, articulated objects. So uh, we don't use depth at all, but we leverage these like um, very cheap sort of stereo sensors to transfer it to real world without any retraining or fine tuning. And this would appear uh, in this here as a CVPR as well. So um, for um, holistic uh, scene level reconstruction um, that we have seen so far, uh, only predicting shapes in an isolated manner may not yield good results. Uh, and, and this is really due to the challenges of aligning objects in the 3D space, our reasoning about occlusions as well as diverse uh, backgrounds. And um, hence we also basically in this follow-up work that I'm just gonna talk about uh, now, uh, improve upon this prior work to include appearance reconstruction as well. Uh, as well as also improve upon accuracy of the detected poses. And so um, this work, uh, in this work, we, the main theme here would be to utilize both geometry and appearance priors for this generalizable shape and appearance reconstruction, as well as incorporate object-centric scene context. Um, and the goal here is really made possible by three components. First, a single shot detection, which we really um, saw earlier, which is really, really similar to center snap, uh, with the main difference of being of also predicting textures as well as masks here um, as like separate heads. Second, uh, we learned this implicit joint differentiable database of shape and appearance priors, uh, where our shape representation is uh, slightly more sophisticated um, and goes back to one of the earlier slides. So we use implicit representations to denote shapes here. Uh, which is represented as sign distance function. And for textures, we have this texture field concept where the textures are really defined at the object surface since they're um, an ill pose problem uh, all, at every else point. And finally, once we do these uh, single shot sort of inference using the differentiable optimization that we uh, will talk about, we, we do this um, differentiable optimization as a post-processing optimization stage. Um, so once we have predicted these um, latent codes using an initial encoder network, we don't actually need these encoders uh, for our downstream sort of application. So we freeze these networks or we basically discard them and we directly optimize our decoder in some cases as well as basically our, our major goal is to optimize these latent codes, which really improves, uh, as you will see, the performance of our center staff network uh, by a lot and also allow us, us to basically optimize these appearance from just a single view RGBD observation without any um, sort of downstream labels. So let's go deep into the specifics of each module. Um, first, we extend center snap to include appearance and segmentation mask uh, that we um, just saw in a very detailed manner what this head was uh, all about. And uh, again, just a reminder, we regress all of these quantities using a single forward pass for efficiency purposes. So our architecture is really comprised of, again, a single forward pass and a convolution, deconvolution, multi-header architecture, where again, we have four heads, one for each um, specific task of shape, uh, pose, texture, and mass prediction. Uh, and we really optimize these using, again, uh, a collection of supervised losses. Uh, and these losses are basically optimized uh, from a large collection of synthetic data with very minimal real-world fine-tuning. So again, uh, we, uh, we are, uh, there is a large uh, sort of opportunity available here to just forego that requirement. And we are uh, actually some of, uh, again, working on some of these uh, opportunities to basically not require any real world 3D labels at all. So similar to center snap, we learn a shape prior um, here, but we also include appearance in this shape representation. Um, our shape uh, representation here is a fully implicit representation where um, it takes in a position X, Y, Z coordinate and outputs, again, a scalar assigned distance value to the surface uh, of the object. For appearance, we use this texture field concept. So given an X, Y, Z coordinates, we use, um, uh, we output this RGB using another sort of neural network. Um, 
And finally, uh, we use this auto decoder architecture, which is very, very similar to this point cloud um, auto encoder architecture, except that we don't have an encoder at the, at the input where we directly sort of optimize this sort of uh, latent codes while uh, regularizing the latent code in, in such a way that uh, have such a nice properties of, of shape space, which we'll talk about um, in a bit. Uh, and the goal here is to basically minimize uh, the reconstruction loss, where the reconstruction loss here is defined by the, the ground truth SDF loss, um, as well as the RGB losses. So a naive way uh, for this network uh, to train is to basically uh, really let the end end to end network figure out the disentanglement uh, between the object instances, uh, which is really not efficient um, at all and also not really helpful for these downstream sort of uh, 2D regression stage. So essentially um, the goal of this network is basically to reconstruct or, or basically ma uh, make this differentiable database of priors, which is finding a unique shape and texture space where um, each object occupies this own um, uh, space in that uh, uh, larger dimensional shape space. Uh, and we, we want this like uh, each category to be clustered together in one unique space. We can identify that easily using another neural network for this down, downstream optimization. And here we really show this latent space interpolation of our network where you can see that a lot of work went into shaping this latent space where uh, our, our, our goal of this latent space to have a smooth um, a representation um, and, and, and basically uh, just like not have discontinuities when we are moving around between objects. And lastly, um, uh, we talked about sh uh, shaping the latent space. So here you can see we, we added these contrastive losses during um, pre-training of these 3D representation. Um, and without contrastive losses, you can see that as humans, you can still sort of disentangle this representation, but as a network, it really gets really, really hard for it to regress this in downstream, um, uh, basically optimization task. And so adding these um, contrastive losses really allows uh, disentangled object category learning, uh, and which is we've shown to be really, really instrumental for these downstream regression tasks. Um, now our goal, uh, now that we have studied how we can use these 3D representation, the goal is to really regress all of these quantities in our 2D regression stage. Um, and we utilize two different MLPs um, to get one, one, one for shape and another for texture representation. So to get um, surface from ZSDF, um, you basically that's uh, our aim for this sort of inference stage. We basically want to get a nice sort of cleaner um, surface representation from the ZSTF, which is encoded in our basically shape representation. So now our trivial solution to basically get the surface from the ZSTF values is basically to evaluate your STF MLP at all the points in our network and um, disregard or threshold some of the points which are lower than the, uh, the threshold value and that's how this procedure basically gives you the surface. But unfortunately, this procedure is not differentiable uh, with respect to the input latent vector ZSTF, and we can't sort of backpropagate the gradients uh, back to the original sort of encoder network. So we utilize the fact that um, derivating this SDF values, um, it's a very simple sort of mathematical formulation, and, and um, it's basically deriving an SDF value with respect to the input sort of coordinates X, Y, Z really gives you the normal vectors at these points, uh, which can be computed in a single for a uh, sort of backward pass. And this animation from this paper really gives you a very nice visualization of how you can, once you've estimated the normals, uh, you can really move in the direction of normals um, uh, computed by the STF value that you predict, uh, and you can get the surface. And um, fortunately, this process is like fully differentiable for us. So we can back propagate the gradients all the way to the, 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 the input network or the encoder network as well. So another sort of observation or efficient, uh, inefficiency that we actually found out in this whole optimization process was that extracting the object surface from a pre-trained sort of SDF network is really extremely inefficient in the sense that you have to query your uh, word grid for every single point um, in your um, sort of world grid, which is which can, which can be get like extremely inefficient, which you can see here uh, from 216,000 points for let's say a, a bottle shape, you only get like, you know, 603.6, which is 
uh, all the other points uh, don't lead to any uh, sort of object surface hit. And so we propose an octree-based procedure to efficiently extract points. And this is another novelty that we had in this work. Uh, we defined a coarse uh, voxel grid, uh, which is really estimating um, the STF values for these coarse voxel grids, uh, instead of estimating, let's say, for all the points in our um, uh, you know, world grid. So you're using a pre-trained STF network with the disregard voxels whose STF values are larger than the voxel grid size for that resolution level. So here, let's say the resolution level is LOD4, uh, and the remaining voxels are then subdivided each into eight new voxels. Uh, and then we repeat this process procedure really until we get the desired resolution level. And you can really um, get like as much resolution as you want, but it's primarily also determined by how much you can fit into your GPU memory as well. Uh, so we use, I think at max, uh, LOD8 in our um, final reconstruction. And this is again, again, in the surface plus textures from these um, surface representations. So here we show an example 3D to 3D optimization procedure of our method where one can see that we can optimize towards a novel shape with a new texture in a few iterations using, um, again, these like optimization uh, neural network pipeline, which really shows our uh, network's ability to overfit to these uh, novel um, instances. Here we uh, more call, uh, show more qualitative results for these multi-object shape and appearance reconstruction on novel um, object instances. And again, these um, representations were primarily trained on synthetic data with very minimal um, sort of real world fine tuning. So here we show the improved uh, pose estimation accuracy compared to NOx again. Um, and you can see that these, uh, these op uh, poses are optimized version of the original um, let's say the single shot inference that we saw in center snap. Um, and, and we can see that we can even sort of extract more performance out of this network using these like a very cheap sort of inference time optimization stage where given the single RGBD observation, we can uh, even optimize for these uh, poses in addition to the shape and appearance or reconstruction. Um, here we show this, uh, I moved really fast, so I'm just gonna back it up. So here we show this live optimization of object instances using a single view RGBD uh, observation. Um, and the goal here uh, is to really qualitatively study if we manually inject the noise in our inference time predictions uh, and see if our optimization network can take, um, sort of make some progress and, 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 and uh, gives us reasonable shape and textures. So here you can see that uh, we manually inject noise in let's say the laptop or GB, uh, the shape prediction as well as the post prediction quality. So they start from like um, a mean, which is different than the depth point cloud and kind of optimize both the shape and appearance as well as the poses simultaneously. So one benefit of this representation is that it really generalizes um, to in the wild uh, scenarios as well. And here uh, we show a result on Xtion Pro live camera, which is mounted on an HSR robot. And um, um, here we did this uh, in, in Toyota uh, Research Institute uh, HSR robot. And um, it, it's, it's, it's a very nice uh, cool result where you can actually see that this technique also works for um, backgrounds as well as objects which are never seen during training. So lastly, um, we ask ourselves like three key questions, how to validate our approach. Qualitatively, we've, we've already seen um, some of these um, deconstruction qualities. But uh, first we'll see how, how, how well does our um, network recovers the pose and sizes of novel objects. Secondly, we'll see how well we do in terms of reconstructing geometry and appearance. And lastly, we'll see how well the differentiable iterative improvement and this multi-level uh, optimization impact the shape, appearance and pose optimization. So we show that our, 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 our method can really outperform um, all of these uh, baselines again, which are uh, two stage approaches and train sort of a single model for a category. Uh, but then in contrast, our method is like um, uh, in category agnostic, which really doesn't need these instance masks or labels uh, in downstream, downstream um, sort of um, inference task while still achieving a very good uh, accuracy number. So we achieve almost like 85.3% accuracy on these real world instances, uh, around like 93% IUU50 on these uh, camera synthetic 
as well as like almost like 89.2 10 degrees 10 centimeter from this like pure synthetic um, while uh, pure synthetic sort of uh, data set. And lastly, again, this is like chamfer distance metric. So uh, our, our pose estimation is like also nicer, but uh, we also reconstruct shapes um, to, a, to a reasonable degree of accuracy as well. Here we show the impact of our octree-based um, differentiable projection, where we can see that uh, our representation is significantly more efficient than the ordinary uh, grid representation, where just a reminder, the ordinary grid was again, um, evaluating the SDF field for all the points, which can be get extremely inefficient. So you can see for some of these like large input point numbers, you only get like these um, uh, in outputs as your um, output point clouds. And all the all of the uh, others don't actually contribute to the reconstructing the surface. So one interesting result here is that while LOD7 provides the best overall result, we use LOD6 for, for our experiments and it's really a trade-off between sort of speed, memory, and, and the reconstruction quality of our network. And lastly, uh, you'll see some of the texture quality ablation where we basically measure PSNR numbers, which is pixel uh, peak signal to noise ratio, which really determines like how well you're reconstructing the RGB appearance of, of our network. And, uh, with fine tuning a network, we can get some some reasonable um, accuracy of um, the P, uh, the appearance reconstruction, which we also saw in some of the qualitative results. So here, um, yeah, I want to thank all my collaborators from uh, Tivota Research as well as Georgia Tech um, and and also the mentors for their um, guidance and all the support throughout this process. And yeah, I think I'm going to conclude my talk by saying like you can also like go to these. Uh, you can scan this QR code and also like look at some of these uh, publications, which are, are submitted like ICRA and ACC we don't need to do. And um, yeah, I think I'll close my talk um, by saying, if, yeah, opening the floor for any questions. Thank you so much for this interesting talk where uh, I really enjoyed it. I have a few questions though. Uh, so you talked about the natural language part. Uh, so sorry, you talked about the real world data set part that you want to completely remove the fine tuning from the real world data set. So mm -hmm. is, is the reason for this is that because this, that data is hard to get or hard to annotate or is it something else? Yeah, uh, if, I, if I understand your question correctly, you're asking about um, why do you want to move away from fine tuning the real world data set, I guess? Yeah. Yeah, so right now we, we as you uh, um, as I talked about, we basically use these 2000 real world fine tuning examples. And the way I see fine tuning is that, let's say you have uh, a different camera parameter or you have different object instances in your homes. So you give this model some like 100 examples which are fully labeled um, and the model can be really fine tuned to your specific home and then it can reconstruct uh, all sort of instances, um, assuming that there are like not much shape variations uh, from those instances and it can reconstruct to a certain degree of accuracy. Um, so the mod model is really fine tuned to your specific house. Uh, but one problem here, again, as you highlighted above is like, it's very difficult to label all of these um, annotations. Um, and so we, we basically require more than just 2D annotations, which could be easy to obtain from, let's say some of the SAM uh, segment, anything or all of these like different uh, in the wild uh, segmentation that are available, but we basically require th 3D CAD models. We require uh, you to label the uh, 6D sort of poses, which means that you have to label these like 3D bounding boxes as well. So it can get really, really expensive really, really quickly. So if you were to, let's say, annotate like 100 examples, it can get really, really uh, expensive. So one way we are actually looking at this problem is to just remove that requirement altogether, just utilize fully synthetic models that we have learned in simulation and a large scale sort of just RGBD data. So um, that's sort of like a sneak peek uh, of maybe one of the works that might be, you'll soon be hearing out. Um, but um, we are basically considering this like meta learning of like supervised plus self-supervised losses, uh, which uh, would hopefully forego the need of requiring any labels at all in, um, in basically inference time for the real world scenarios. Got it. 
So what if we use these model like we what if we use Jack or Center Snap to annotate old data? Do you think that can uh, be a good source for annotating the real world data? Set? Yeah, that's also another. Yeah, that's a great question as well. Uh, we we were thinking of considering that as our proxy task to test this net, uh, in in our ECCV submission. Uh, but we eventually uh, yeah, couldn't get time to explore it. But I think that's a very nice way to basically see this problem. So we kind of, uh, I think that the thing that you're referring to is called auto-labeling pipeline. Uh, for sure, I think basically we can inject sort of these, uh, yeah, the, 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 we can initialize, I guess the goal is to initialize that, that uh, your data with the teacher network from Shapo and CenterSnap and sort of iteratively improve upon um, the network by distilling these knowledge from these like teacher network to a student network where the student network can be uh, a model for your own home but the teacher network can be model which is trained on uh, these large collection of shapes which basically shapeo is so yeah i think that's uh, that's that that could be another cool interesting direction as well yeah exactly and you also mentioned about the uh, text to 3D in the beginning uh, of the talk. So do you think that adding some kind of language supervision uh, in this, uh, just like as clip or some models like that, do we can improve the representations that are learned uh, and that can mm -hmm. move uh, these kinds of uh, algorithms to text and 3D in a better way? Yeah. Yeah, so I one thing actually, yeah, it's interesting that you mentioned it. One thing I'm actually actively looking at right now uh, as a follow up to these uh, works uh, is actually this language text to 3D content creation. And I really like this, like all of uh, the recent successes of these like diffusion models and now people are extending them to 3D. So uh, we just show like, I think one example, which is uh, a dream fusion, I think uh, the example that I yeah uh, showed in my slide earlier. Um, but for sure, I think I really like this idea of like content creation made easy through these uh, models. And um, yeah, I think one thing that I'm actively sort of currently working on is how we can how we can we reconstruct sort of these 3D shapes just using text inputs. Um, also, um, some unconditional generation uh, while also considering other conditional generations, such as let's say a point cloud um, or maybe voxels to like these elaborate 3D shapes. Um, so it can really help us, let's say, um, create these contents from just um, language or very, very like, uh, I would say sparse data structures, like even sketches from going from sketches to these, these like models or even like nerves could be really, really cool to explore, yeah. Thank you so much for uh, taking our time and presenting this really interesting work. Uh, I really enjoyed it a lot. And gave me a new sense of motivation to work exploring these kinds of things. Yeah, thanks. Thanks again for the invite. Uh, it's my pleasure.